Hi, everyone. Thank you to all who are joining. We will just give um, one more minute for some more folks to join, and then we will go ahead and get started. All right, so it is four minutes after the hour. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by Hepatitis Delta Connect. My name is Beatrice Sovich, and I'm a public health program manager at the Hepatitis B Foundation and the manager of Hepatitis Delta Connect. Thank you all for tuning in today. Today's webinar is going to be focused on the international profile of hepatitis delta, including its epidemiology and challenges with diagnostics and management of the virus in different contexts around the world, especially those where bulevertide, which is the only the first ever drug approved to treat hepatitis delta, is not yet available. We will have an opportunity today to hear from experts across five continents, including North and South America, Africa, Asia, and Australia, who will share about the prevalence of hepatitis delta in their region and insights into any unmet needs that remain with the virus, as well as ideas for how to overcome these. And so we're looking forward to a very robust discussion. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So before we get started, I would just like to remind all participants that during today's webinar, all audience members are muted. We encourage you to use the chat feature to let us know who you are and where you are joining from. And if you have any technical challenges, please indicate your issue using the chat box and we will address it as soon as possible. If at any time during the presentation you have questions, we encourage you to enter them into the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed by panelists at the conclusion of the panel discussion, and the session is also being recorded, and slide presentations will also be shared with registrants following the webinar. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just a brief overview before we get started of Hepatitis Delta Connect. This is a dedicated program of the Hepatitis B Foundation, which and it was established in 2016 for the explicit purpose of raising awareness about hepatitis delta and promoting diagnosis, screening, research, and linkage to care, as well as providing support for those who are living with and affected by hepatitis delta through a variety of channels, including email and phone consults, social media, newsletters, blog posts, a website, and webinars such as this one. We are hoping to continue to build and expand our programming throughout 2023, and we will keep you posted about these developments and further opportunities to get involved. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we are very excited and honored to be joined today by a diverse group of panelists who will share some of their insights about the evolving world of hepatitis delta across the globe today. So we will be joined by five speakers altogether, and they are first Dr. Robert Gish, who wears many hats, but among which are hepatologist and medical director of the Hepatitis B Foundation in the United States. Dr. Mark Douglas, who is an associate professor at the University of Sydney, Westmead Clinical School in Sydney, Australia, Dr. Ganiat Oyelecki, who is a hepatologist and gastroenterologist at Lagos University Teaching Hospital in Lagos, Nigeria, Dr. Saeed Hamid, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine and Director of the Clinical Trials Unit at the Aga Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan, and Dr. Thor Dantas, who is a hepatologist and associate professor at the Universidade Federal de Acre in Rio de Acre, Brazil. Uh, so we're very excited to hear from all of our panelists today, and we're really grateful to them for joining us. So we will begin with a brief presentation from each panelist about the epi epidemiology of hepatitis delta in their country, followed by an open panel discussion and concluding with questions from the audience. So again, we invite all audience members to put any questions you may have in the Q&A box as they arise. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Dr. Gish um, to get us started with a brief overview of hepatitis delta in the United States. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks, Beatrice, and really appreciate you and Hepatitis B Foundation, the Connect group, to make this happen today. So hepatitis delta in the US, the data is going to be a little bit foggy. Uh, we have one problem, and we're going to start out with a need, which is adequate delta testing. There are two major labs in the US that probably share 80% of the lab market. One of those two laboratories has had Delta testing for almost eight years. And that includes uh, Delta total antibody, which is the key screening test and Delta RNA PCR quant. The other major lab has not had any Delta testing in house and they did send out their Delta RNA for a qualitative test to a lab that I had not even seen any data published from. So we have 
almost half the US did not have Delta testing over the last decade as Delta awareness became involved. So with that preamble and gap and need with the data that we have in the US, we're extrapolating to about a prevalence of 3% of Delta antibody positive in the US hepatitis B population. So this is a double extrapolation because we also have deficiencies in hepatitis B epidemiology in the country because until two months ago, uh, it wasn't mandatory or recommended to test everybody for Delta. You're supposed to take a big risk history and for B, also take another risk history. But <clears throat> using that three to 4% number, we're coming up with uh, ep evidence for the prevalence of Delta to be about 100,000. You've heard numbers as high as 150,000 in the US. And there's some recent projections. I think this is data from the Polaris group that it's 70 to 80,000. And again, this is antibody positivity. So here's another gap. Just because you have antibody doesn't mean you've been tested for PCR. And interesting in the Delta world, about a third of Delta antibody positive patients are PCR negative, not showing evidence of active infection. So we're kind of having to do four levels of evidence, linking those four levels of evidence to get down to this prevalence number that's in the 70 to 100,000 range who are viremic today. And it's the presence of the virus that really counts in that uh, next discussion, which is a natural history. We have gaps in natural history because we have gaps in prevalence and we also have gaps in incidence. Um, just because Delta testing is not available in some settings and others are not aware of the testing process. Um, one more thing on the epi in the US, and that is what we call hotspots. And because Delta is mostly an issue of an immigrant population in the US with a subgroup of risk-based behavior, that we have hotspots in uh, Illinois, specifically in Chicago, the Northeast Corridor, and also in California with hot spots in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. There are some other hot spots. Another paper that's going to be presented at EASL said Utah had a high prevalence of Delta. But let's talk about Utah for a moment. ARIP, another fantastic lab, but it's a reference lab more than a national lab uh, for regular testing, has had Delta testing back as far as 2013. There's two key individuals or close colleagues of mine who developed that at AREP. So Utah may be a hotspot just because of test availability as opposed to a true prevalence number. So as hepatitis B comes out to attest all adults in the US, we really need to move the guidelines to test all B patients for Delta with antibody reflex to PCR. I'm hoping these gaps, uh, Beatrice, and uh, to the other wonderful panel speakers, that we can address those gaps as new therapies come out, because people don't test because there's no therapy. And if you don't test, you don't know epi, so you don't know how to bring a therapy to market. All these are intertwined. That's my closing comment for this intro. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gish. Um, really great points about the hotspots and just the general need for more testing, specifically in the US where the guidelines do not yet recommend it. So hopefully that can change, especially as new treatments hopefully become available. Um, so really appreciate your insights. Um, I think Dr. Douglas was not able to join us from Australia today. So I think we will move to Dr. Oyeleki, if that's okay, and um, can give us a picture of Delta in Nigeria. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Oyeleki, and today I'll be uh, doing the overview of epidemiology of um, HDV from Nigeria. Oh, I think you may have frozen. Um, that will give you one, I'll give it a minute. I'm a hepatologist and gastroenterologist. I'm also the director of the World Gastroenterology League of Australia. Is it good? Yes, Hello? I think now it's better. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, so yeah, so um, so I just put this up so that we know, um, like we have an idea of what is happening in Africa. Uh, we know that the that chronic hepatitis B infection is a global uh, disease, and studies by Hughes and Wedmay have found that more than 240 million people are chronic 
chronic carriers of hepatitis B, which contributes to substantial motility and morbidity involving liver um, cirrhosis, liver cancer, and death. And in Africa, and you can, as you can see in the, the, the slide, uh, you see the high body. We have a high burden of um, hepatitis B is a huge one. Uh, the prevalence of hepatitis B is 8.8%. And so co-infection of hepatitis B and Delta is associated with expedited uh, progression to cirrhosis and more aggressive and severe form of um, viral hepatitis. As you can see the wording, you can see that Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, um, has a, a, a quite a high prevalence uh, compared to other zones of the world. And um, in a systemic review and meta-analysis by Stockdale et al., which was published um, in Lancet Global Health in 2017, um, the prevalence of hepatitis D in Africa was extensively analyzed and among general population, hepatitis D, Delta, um, seroprevalence varied widely within geographical regions from um, different parts of Africa. So in West Africa, for example, where I, Nigeria is in West Africa, we, um, there was a, a prevalence range of 0 0.34 to 22.27% 20, was recorded in 7.34 to 66.13% in South Africa, and a, a lower um, prevalence in um, Southern Africa and East Africa of between 0 to 5.3%. Um, Cameroon um, was found to have a very high prevalence um, in, in this um, meta-analysis that was done. The pooled overall prevalence of hepatitis D in, in Africa was 8.39%, while those, uh, the pooled prevalence in West Africa was 7.33, and um, much higher, like I said, in Central Africa, with a pooled prevalence of 256 and much lower in, um, in East and Southern Africa. So back home in Nigeria, what do we have? In Nigeria also, we have a variation in the uh, in parts and in geographical locations. So you have um, the northern parts of Nigeria recording a much higher prevalence. So a study um, done by Abdul Karim at all in Nigeria found a total prevalence of 18.9 complicated hepatitis B had 16.7 and complicated hepatitis B about 30%. Um, the disparity, the value came down much, much lower um, prevalence compared to the North at 5.6% uh, and Southwestern Nigeria, 11.11% 11 .11 in a study uh, by Conde et al. And in Southwest Nigeria, another study um, found a slightly lower prevalence than the one that was, um, the, the, the one that was done in 2020. So this shows that among different um, geographical location, you have variation in the in the in the incident in the prevalence of um, hepatitis D data. We know that the higher prevalence may be as a result of certain cultural practices um, like scarifications. Um, people still do some traditional circumcisions in some area. There's also um, use of certain traditional medicine using which may use infected equipment, um, lack of awareness um, and education, um, family history of hepatitis D has been found in some studies to um, contribute to the higher prevalence, poor health infrastructure um, in, in some parts that are not so readily accessible to, um, um, to, to have access to uh, medical uh, facilities. So these are briefly uh, what I have on the overview of of epidemiology of hepatitis D in Nigeria and in Africa. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Reilecki. It's a very helpful overview um, and really striking differences. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, very, yeah, striking differences among different parts of the continent and the country. So that's great to know. Um, and also to um, 
uh, you know, to, to keep in mind some of the reasons for, um, for higher prevalence in certain areas. So uh, thank you so much for your insights. Um, thank you. So I think uh, now we will turn to Dr. Hamid um, to share with us an overview uh, briefly of hepatitis delta in Pakistan. Um, so Dr. Hamid, I hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Can you see the slide? I'll yeah. just put it on slideshow. I'll try to put it on slideshow if I can. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Okay, thank you for the kind invitation, first of all. Um, and it's really um, a pleasure to see Hepatitis B Foundation getting involved in Delta ever since 2017. I didn't know that. That was such a long history. Anyway, I just have a very short presentation. Uh, so Pakistan is a high burden country for Delta. Uh, we, we know this from, from multiple surveys. Unfortunately, these surveys are mostly done in clinics and there are no really good population-based surveys. But nonetheless, this is a hotspot, a large hotspot, you might want to call it, which is in the middle of the country, which covers the uh, uh, the upper part of the province of Sindh. Um, I we are we are at the, at the lower end. I'm in Karachi, and and that's the coastal town, where a cyclone was going to hit us today, which which it didn't, fortunately. So so we've been lucky. <laughs> Otherwise, I would not, I I might not have had a uh, a stable connection. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the 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 prevalence and the, this is this is what we did uh, with all uh, with with, the, with about nine thousand samples that were sent to our lab. Uh, and they were surface antigen positive. We just tested them. This is just a Delta antibody that was done. And uh, just to get a, get an idea of what really is happening. And based on that, we could define this large hotspot where the prevalence in these hepatitis B positive patients varies any, from anywhere to about 19% to, to almost 60%. Um, uh, funnily enough, uh, on, on our eastern border, India doesn't report that much Delta at all, and it is difficult to understand why that is. Maybe that there's not enough testing or, or whatever. Uh, but in any case, this uh, if we translate this to the whole country, it gives us a prevalence of about 16.6%. Remember, our surface antigen positivity is about 2 to 2.5%, something like that. Um, uh, so uh, we, we can we can say 16.6 percent for Delta, but that really is not the uh, a true estimation because if you go out of this uh, hotspot, <coughs> then you can see in some places only it's only about four percent, three percent. So it's very difficult to uh, to generalize, and that's the difficulty with uh, some of the epidemiology of Delta when we talk about this. So let's pick a hotspot, which is even even more hotter than the others, and that is Sakhar, which is about sixty percent. And what we did was we got the, the 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 there is a sentinel site for Delta uh, at in Sakhar, which drains quite a lot of people from uh, patients from that area to come for treatment and so on. So this is we we got hold of this data, which is from two thousand ten to two thousand fifteen. I'm sorry, this is late, but, but, but quite a quite a relatively old data, but we really don't have good epidemiology to to, to do this uh, in in real time right now. So six hundred and eighteen patients, out of which about sixty eight were children. Our cutoff at that time was sixteen years. Um, uh, who, who reported to this uh, to this uh, to this center uh, uh, because they were found to be they were found to be delta positive. Uh, all had compensated the delta antibody and PCR were positive, and all of these patients, as per protocol, with, with, with uh, prior to treatment, had a delivered biopsy. So what we could see is, in a nutshell, that overall 338 patients of 54.7 percent had severe fibrosis at at presentation, which was stage three and four. And when you looked at the pediatric population and compared them to the adult ones, the pediatric population seemed to have a much higher, significantly higher fibrosis at almost about 74% of these kids versus 57% in the adults. So, and and need to say, most as most studies ex, uh, suggest, 80% of these were males. So, what was happening in these adult in these pediatric populations? Why were they getting more um, uh, more severe fibrosis? We believe that it is. It was probably because of the fact that the HPV DNA levels were much higher, as not significantly, but certainly higher as compared to the adults, as you can see on the slide. And also, 
these kids had a, 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 a larger proportion of these kids had higher HPV DNA levels, which was greater than 10 to the five in 75% of these, of, these, of these children and adolescents, which means that the, both, the, uh, both viruses were replicating actively and probably contributing to the fibrosis. As Bob said, a lot of these people can be delta negative. So the 11% the of the pediatric patients were negative as opposed to about 23%, nearly a quarter of the adult patients who were uh, delta uh, PCR uh, negative, uh, despite the fact that they were delta antibody positive. Uh, so this translates into impact on, uh, on, on other health services. So in this area, we have a transplant center in Sakhar, in fact, very close to Sakhar in a place called Gambat. And the, the biggest indicator, the, the indication that they have right now for transplantation is actually uh, hepatitis delta. Sorry, after, after HCV, they have hepatitis delta as the biggest indicator. In fact, it is the biggest indicator at 188 uh, 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 transplants out of 482. So, so there, is, there is a significant impact on health. Um, we are part of what, what is called the Hepatitis Delta International Network, and we contributed um, a, a fair number of patients into, into this study, uh, into this database. And just, just as a comparison, which, which, I, which I think was, was, was quite interesting, uh, was to show that, uh, that uh, patients from Pakistan were younger uh, patients from Eastern Europe uh, were older than patients from Pakistan. They were younger uh, 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 and significantly younger at 32 years of age. Uh, patients from Pakistan were more likely to be E antigen positive, 35% compared to other regions from where the data was available. Delta RNA was found to be often more positive in patients with, uh, with, uh, from Pakistan, about 87% total versus compared to Eastern Europe or Central Europe or South America. In Pakistan, 60% of the patients were HPV DNA positive compared to only 14, 14% in South America for some reason. So just to conclude, uh, Delta, uh, there's a large hotspot of Delta within, within the country, which contributes to much of the uh, morbidity and mortality from this infection. Hepatitis Delta causes severe hepatitis in children, and they, they, these, these kids should not be forgotten from future trials and, and other opportunities that may be available for, for treating them. But, and, and, and these are particularly those kids who are actively replicating both viruses. Patients from Pakistan more likely are to be E antigen positive, RNA positive, and HBB DNA positive. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, I hope that this will generate some discussion uh, in terms of uh, further epidemiological stuff that we need to do in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamid. Um, that's great to know about a lot of the uh, particularly age and gender differences uh, surrounding hepatitis delta and its pediatric burden as well. So we really appreciate your insights. Um, and then for a final uh, brief overview, I will pass it to Dr. Dantas uh, to share with us a little bit about Brazil. Um, and Kara, would you mind uh, sharing Dr. Dantas' slide? Thank you so much. And I pass it to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Dr. Robert Gish and colleagues for having me today for this discussion. Well, uh, I'll, I'll present some insights about the epidemiology of HDV in Brazil and Latin America. Uh, if you can advance, please, one slide for me. Okay, so Brazil is considered to be one of the top five countries in the world regarding HDV prevalence among general population. But uh, these maps are challenging to build and interpret because as we can see, the whole country here, Brazil is painted in the same color, but actually uh, it does not really represent the real epidemiology in the country. As we can see, uh, other countries around Brazil in the north of South America are painted even redder than Brazil. And actually, next, please. Next slide. Actually, we have a, a region here in the western part of the Amazon basin. Uh, which include Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and Bolivia. 
which is highly endemic for HDV. Uh, and um, I live here in the state of Acre, which is in the very center of this Western Amazon basin region. And notably, uh, HDV is very uncommon in the east part of the Amazon basin. And noteworthy also, it's completely absent in the non-Amazon regions of Brazil, uh, as, as we, we saw from other countries, other parts of the world, it's a, it's a, it seems to be a common feature of HDV distribution this heterogeneity. And next slide, please. Okay, so here we have both genotype one and three. Um, and well, genotype three, as we, we, we know, is the most divergent of all the genotypes. It's exclusive to the Amazon region. It's more prevalent here in the rural population than urban one. The genotype T3 is not included in clinical trials, and it's considered to be the most aggressive of, of all the genotypes. Next, please. And this is uh, a typical landscape of the Amazon, the rural location of the Amazon. The transmission of delta hepatitis here is mainly interfamilial horizontal non-sexual transmission during early childhood and contributes to this transmission uh, large families in a small and overcrowded house. And this also impose uh, great challenges in assessing these isolated locations in the middle of the forests frequently. Next, please. And so our overall prevalence here is about 13.5% of serology among HBV patients, but it can be as high as 67%, for instance, in some rural communities. And also again, uh, noteworthy, there's a remarkable heterogeneity in the distribution, even in the same river, in the same region of the Western Amazon, we can see some rural communities with as high as 70%. In the same river, we see some prevalence uh, very low, and this is a challenge to understand why. Okay, next, please. I would like to end up with these uh, uh, thoughts about our challenges. Uh, I think we have to, to assure an interrupted supply of HDV tests in, the, in endemic areas. Uh, HDV tests are not incorporated into the Brazilian national health system yet. So it's up to each state to, to supply these, these tests. Uh, obviously implement reflex tests in the Amazon basin and uh, implement active HDV surveillance in rural areas and rural communities of Amazon basin. Certainly monitor the spread of HDV to the non-Amazon regions of Brazil because people migrate from one area to other and obviously uh, access better treatment options than we have today. And thank you. Uh, next, please. I'd like to thank you for this invitation and I'm open to the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Dantas. Um, we really appreciate your points about the differences in genotypes and um, also geographic distribution as well uh, and the need for, for greater testing for sure. Um, so we really appreciate um, all of your the overviews that you all provided. Um, and at this time, we will start a short um, panel discussion um, to kind of discuss some broader uh, issues and challenges with hepatitis delta. 
Um, and just a reminder to audience members, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the question and answer box and we will address them uh, closer to the end. So for the first question, um, a lot of you talked about um, the, the need for kind of greater testing uh, in your area and the kind of gaps in um, understanding the true epidemiological profile of the disease. Um, so just to kind of go a little deeper into that, um, if you can describe um, in terms of diagnostics, what would sort of help to facilitate um, better diagnostics? Is it, you know, I know um, better guidelines were brought up. Is it better infrastructure? Um, there, I know there was a need for reflex testing um, in some places and for both antibody and PCR testing kind of closing that gap. Um, so just to, be, um, to elaborate a little more on some of the diagnostic challenges and what could sort of help facilitate uh, better testing. Um, so I'll open it to anyone who would like to go first. Okay, so uh, let me... Okay, ladies first. Go first. <laughs> All right, so... Okay, so um, to facilitate uh, diagnostics, um, and I think from our own side, uh, I mean, back home here, the first thing is awareness and education. And I think um, we realize that some healthcare professionals do not even um, understand how hepatitis D, um, the knowledge about hepatitis D is really, really deficient. So I think the first will be awareness, um, talk to um, maybe through CMEs or programs like this um, for doctors to be aware. Then the other thing is, um, I think um, Dr. Dance has mentioned that about the guidelines and um, as well. So um, sometimes it's, it's challenging when even diagnosis, you're a bit confused. Am I doing the antigen? Is it the antibody? Is it the DNA, RNA? So um, it, it, if, if a proper guideline is developed um, to, to guide on the, uh, so if, if, if you want to make a diagnosis of hepatitis D, this is what you do. Then also uh, maybe government policies, depending on the, in, in, in the location about, okay, so for patients that have hepatitis, hepatitis B, and you must test everyone for hepatitis um, D as well, if it's uh, available. Then laboratory infrastructure and capacity building is also very important. And um, we do not have places where you can readily test hepatitis D in Nigeria, for example, you know, so, and where it's available, it's expensive and um, most people pay out of pocket. So, and we have a huge burden of hepatitis B, uh, I can't remember, I, I don't think I've seen any screening for hepatitis D on a large scale. So I think we need to uh, work on this, develop, uh, provide infrastructure for the laboratory and um, build capacity to, to have access to the diagnostic tools that um, is, uh, then the point of care. So maybe make it available that so once um, someone has hepatitis B, then then you have to like do uh, a simplified test to make it um, readily available. I think that is what I have on this for now. Thank you. And hopefully collaboration, you know, so I mean, to, to be able to, yeah, yeah, in places where they've done other studies and, um, you know, to, to leverage on that and collaborate and um, yeah, for, wider coverage of the testing. Thank you. Absolutely. I think you've really captured how complicated um, the disease is and the many barriers uh, that exist to even getting people knowledge that they have it and uh, provider education for sure is, uh, can definitely be a challenge. Um, do any others have thoughts on uh, what might facilitate better diagnostics or any, anything else to add? Um, yes, Dr. Gish. So in the U.S., there's one challenge with test development, which is whether you're a class two or a class three test as designated by the FDA. And Delta, in my opinion, my review doesn't really have a designation, but that usually would default to a class three, which is called a pre-market approval, a PMA. And that's just to apply is $380,000 to apply to get an assay approved, short of ever getting it approved. And the threshold is much higher than class two, which is a 510K, which is an equivalence process. 
It's hard to do equivalence if you don't have an approved test, but the barrier is lower and the cost is only $10,000 to apply. That's a huge difference, even for a large company, maybe like Abbott or Roche, to talk about investing that when they may never see an ROI. And that's why we don't have any FDA cleared tests. We use approved for drugs, cleared for tests. So there's no FDA cleared test. The path forward for Delta testing isn't very clear because it's not a three or a two. Uh, so I think it should be designated as a two. We've been working with Hepatitis B Foundation on B redesignation and Delta's nested in there. And that could get uh, companies, including rapid test companies, to come forward. And rapid tests, the lack of rapid tests is another gap that we may wish to discuss. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Hedden. Yeah, so uh, uh, two things. One, uh, it's good to see that consensus is moving towards testing everyone. Uh, I mean, all hepatitis B patients at least once. Although in some places that one-time testing may not be enough, we may need to test multiple times, but at least that's a, that's a step forward. That will allow us to define the epidemiology of Delta much better and therefore align ourselves towards what, what the further care of these patients should look like. And, and there are multiple things that you can do with these patients. For example, uh, you, you know, follow them up closely. Even if you don't have treatment readily available, Follow them up closely, see if, they, if, if they're developing complications. At least in, in many parts of the world, there's still regulatory interferon available that can be used. So uh, all uh, really full marks for, for, for getting uh, uh, at least one-time testing for, the, uh, for all hepatitis B patients on the way. Uh, Bob talked about point of care. I think that is really the way to go for these large-scale testings that we would need to do, particularly in the high-burden countries. Um, and uh, it's it, it complicated. I mean, there are three or four tests. So you first you diagnose B, then you diagnose Delta, then you get a hepatitis D, hepatitis B uh, PCR, then you get a hepatitis Delta PCR, and then you do something uh, to the patient. So point of care testing, uh, uh, we believe, is coming. It's it's uh, it's it's going in fits and starts, but I think there there, there is now hope that soon point of care testing will be available. Um, and if it comes through, I think it will be very helpful to, to, uh, to, to get the epidemiology sorted out, identify the patients and so on. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, there is there is work being done on the point of care tests, which will be enormously helpful for sure. Um, so uh, thank you to the audience members who are putting in questions uh, and we will um, we'll definitely answer them. So we encourage you to continue to do so. Um, so for our next kind of general question for our panel, um, so there's certainly challenges in terms of diagnostics, but then this was mentioned a little bit as well. Um, the, you know, the absence of kind of a, an available drug makes management of the disease very difficult and some of the reluctance that um, comes in testing is because there's no place to really direct people. Um, so just uh, to kind of explore that a little further, if you could talk to some of the challenges that you do encounter in overall management of hepatitis delta in your location, and what advice you might typically give to someone who has recently learned of a hepatitis delta diagnosis. Dr. Gish. There is a perception that if there is no pill or injection slash therapy for a disease, there's no reason to test for the disease. So I think the first issue is if we could get the word out, the education out, and of course in the guidelines eventually, that everybody needs to be tested even if we don't have a therapy or an effective therapy. Uh, the people need to be tested to, be, to know about their disease, to document if anybody in their environment has it to manage them, I think more expectantly because it's three times as aggressive as hepatitis B in general. Those people need to be tested more frequently, followed up, um, uh, restaged, uh, potentially liver cancer surveillance. So the first level of care doesn't require a pill or an injection. And of course, getting a therapy out such as interferon in the US at least, providers are afraid of interferon. It's so much work, so many potential side effects. Um, that people don't even discuss interferon with their patients, even though they should, because it, right now it's our only therapy, first-line therapy approved. And then finally, getting these other therapeutics in front of our patients soon, 
will then motivate more testing, more linkage to care, and motivate companies like LabCorp to get Delta testing available in the community. There's such an incredible matrix or interrelationship here uh, that we all need to work together. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and certainly liver cancer surveillance, really, really good points about that and how that's yeah. still needed regardless of, uh, of treatment for sure. Um, any other thoughts on uh, challenges in terms of management of hepatitis delta um, at this current stage? Um, and then we'll take some, start taking some questions from the audience. If nobody else is speaking, I'll just put in a quick word. Sure. So in, in high burden countries like ours, uh, people know what Delta is generally and what it can do to, to, to patients. They, they've seen death and so on and so forth. So as a diagnosis is made, I think the, the level of, uh, of concern is so high that th this is the time that you really need to talk to patients. As I even showed in, in, in our data, and close to 50% of these patients will not have severe fibrosis at the time, at least at the time of presentation. And therefore, they could be at least put, their minds could be put to rest that, okay, we don't need to do maybe something immediately, but we need to follow you. And we may be able to intervene if there was a need to do so. Interferon, as Bob said, is available. It, it is fairly cheap in our countries. It can be used. It is used. Uh, and while we await the other the other drugs to come in, so uh, so I think it is it is it is critically important to 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 educate these patients, talk to them, and 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 make sure and and get the level of alarm down uh, in, in in many of these patients. Absolutely, yeah. I think any uh, just kind of a wait and see approach is not uh, is not very effective. So. Um, Great. So we had a question uh, come in from the audience. So um, for those that have had patients participate in trials, have you noticed any trends related to genotypes and better outcomes? For example, genotype one and two have had better outcomes, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has had experience with uh, folks in clinical trials or have noticed this. So I'm I'm sorry to just keep talking. I mean, I, this this is terrible. But okay. we, we we're going to present we're going to present the largest phase three study, which you might have heard is the D liver called the D liver study uh, of lonafarnib plus minus peg interferon alpha, which was about 400 patients. Uh, we'll present this at Easel. Um, unfortunately, 98 percent of these patients were genotype one. There were very very few people. Uh, from from elsewhere, uh, not from Asia, but from elsewhere, where, who were who had other genotypes. So there was no really no uh, no way to compare these the, the genotypes, at least in this, which is which is by far the largest trial for Delta uh, until now. So uh, we don't have that information, unfortunately. No problem. Um, thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, let's see. Another question we have is, can specimen handling contribute to the large variation of hepatitis delta positivity and delta RNA results uh, in Pakistan specifically, but also if, um, if others have thoughts as well? Sorry, I didn't get the question about Pakistan. Oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, no problem. Just, yeah. um, Sure, it's can specimen handling contribute to the large variation in delta positivity and delta RNA results in Pakistan? So just a, a possible reason behind that. So, so more, more importantly, I think there are, there are now a lot of setups in our country who, are, who have developed in-house PCRs, which are really not uh, fully uh, authenticated and standardized. And I think that that is a big issue uh, uh, for us uh, because... The standardized tests are only one or two um, uh, companies, and they tend to be pretty expensive. Uh, so people develop their own, uh, you, you know, in-house PCRs, and, and and they can be all over the place. That makes sense. Um, so this, the next question, this comes from Myra, um, and she is curious: How does the production and global distribution of test development? vaccination and treatment for hepatitis delta looks like. Um, so I think um, uh, I think this this might also pertain to hepatitis B as well. 
um, and what kind of what countries are tests available in right now. So speaking, I think a little bit to access. Um, so I think this this is open to to anybody. Um, uh, I'll make a comment here. So we have nearly 200 countries in the world, and there's incredible heterogeneity in terms of test access. You've seen publications from Africa where many countries, we don't even have any epidemiologic data because of both lack of test access and the lack of investigators going into those countries to do surveillance, even with um, LDTs or um, specific laboratories that can do antibody and PCR testing. So I, I think we almost need a map of the world and then have the map updated you know, twice a year or uh, once a year on where PCR tests are available and where antibody tests are available. It's, I, I think it's a huge problem, incredible heterogeneity. And a lot of these countries require or want to have a WHO pre-qualification for a test is used in country. And there, to me, I don't know if there's a direct path forward with WHO for Delta testing, maybe Saeed or one of the other speakers may know. Does anyone else have uh, knowledge about WHO um, guidelines around Delta testing by any chance? Or have more knowledge of it and in your specific region that you'd like to, to speak to? And it can also pertain to hepatitis B as well. I know um, this question included vaccination and treatment. So um, if there's other thoughts. Well, there are WHO guidelines in development. That's all I can say. I'm not allowed to say more than that, but, <laughs> but they are in development. That's good to know. Beatrice, I would, yeah. like, I would like just to add some thoughts about these differences in the prevalence. Please. in the same region as we saw in Pakistan and Amazon. And it is really tricky and, and challenging to understand. And I, I, I think that cultural practice can explain part of this difference, of course, but maybe maybe we, we have to, to focus on some genuine differences in susceptibility in different HBV populations. I, I, I don't think if, if maybe genetic or even difference in the HBV population, in human population and HBV populations, different genotypes and clades that, that maybe, uh, 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 maybe explain this difference because it's something really tricky as, as we see here in Amazon in the same region, the same river. And so it's something that we, we, we maybe we, sh we should focus in, in, in the research in the, uh, that's a question, an open question, and on the math need. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that continues to so happen. Just to, just to respond to that, I, I, I think, yes, um, Dr. Dantes, you, you really need uh, molecular epidemiology stuff to, 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 to figure this out. Um, and uh, we've been we've been struggling to to find to to uh, to understand what is what is it that's that's causing these massive uh, uh, you know transmissions of delta. Um, as you said, th th we believe that this is not vertical transmission. This is horizontal transmission mostly. Uh, it, it is possible that there may be vertical transmission of hepatitis B, and then these kids get very early a horizontal transmission of delta so they 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 get super infection and then they move on uh, in the in the in the in the disease um but from where are they getting this these are the, 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 the presumably they get infected very early in age because as you as i showed you 14 15 16 year olds having severe hepatitis they must have it at least in the infection for 6 7 8 10 years maybe uh, where are they getting these from is is difficult to understand. So uh, we are we're really waiting for point of care tests to try and figure out do 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 these mass studies and try and figure out exactly what's what what's driving this infection. Uh, it's very interesting as you say. Uh, some places in Brazil zero, some places in Brazil sixty percent. Very very similar to what we what we have in our country. So. And, and and I believe similar to similar to Nigeria also is isn't that correct? There are some very high prevalence areas, and then there are some very very low prevalence areas in Nigeria as well. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that's thank you so much for uh, for those important points. Um, 
So I think we have one more audience question and then we will uh, just have one more general question uh, in our remaining time. Uh, so there's uh, one more question. Are there any efforts um, being made to make current knowledge of hepatitis B and Delta vaccination and medication production global? Um, so I, I think this speaks a lot to um, awareness, uh, which I know Dr. Oyelaki, you had spoken to quite a bit. So if there's um, anything, any efforts that you know that are being undertaken to sort of, um, especially in places where, um, you know, hepatitis Delta is less known to raise knowledge and awareness of the need for testing um, among both uh, people impacted by the disease and providers. Um, there's any kind of insights that you that you or, or anyone could share. Um, well, I think it's mutually just to, um, as much as possible, um, encourage, discuss, and um, enlighten. We, we have to keep doing this. Let, um, let them know what We'll put up um, information about hepatitis D, Delta, how it's transmitted, who should be tested. These are the testing kits available. So we have to just keep doing that. And um, um, for us, it's the awareness is still very, very low. And I mean, most of all these testing kits are not available. We don't even have the PCR, you know. So I know that for most of the studies done in Nigeria, they were on just the antibodies, not the PCR. So and knowing that... Um, just about a third of the antibody positive will be, will be uh, will have detected with PCR. So it's important to find a way to uh, streamline and simplify the diagnosis as well. So, um, like I mean, the emphasis on the point of care is also very very important. So we have to just keep um, talking about this um, knowledge, health, healthcare workers, the policy makers, and even the general population. You know, so if patients themselves know that, oh, once I have hepatitis B, I need to ask or discuss about hepatitis Delta, I think sometimes um, that also would help. And um, uh, patients group advocacy and all that would also help as well. So um, that's, I feel, would help to increase and limit the, the lack of awareness and knowledge about hepatitis um, B in our in hepatitis D. But I, I'm hoping that um, with this, uh, we have a number of Nigerians on the call now. So we're hoping more people would um, discuss this with their patients and, and move this forward as well. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, really important points about um, patient empowerment and also advocacy as well uh, to, um, you know, larger decision makers, I think is really crucial. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question. Um, and that is, so if and when uh, a medication other than interferon does get approved um, in your area, would you anticipate any barriers that might arise um, around this, such as availability for prescription, for example, uh, financial accessibility, um, or any other uh, sort of challenges in that regard? And, and how, um, how do you think these, these might be addressed? Yes. You go first. Uh, I'll keep it short because I know we just have a few minutes left. So in the U.S., a test, a, a therapy gets approved or a test gets approved. There's still multiple steps after that that have to do with insurance approval, CMS, Medicare approval, and private insurance, and then other insurance like the VA. So it's complex to bring a new therapy or a new test to market because of these multiple layers that take place. So yes, there are barriers, and the barriers are getting it approved, getting it on formulary, getting insurance company to pay for it, contract in place, see how much the copay is. Also, their copay cards. Um, so it's sometimes it's up to a year from a drug getting on the shelf to really having broad access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, other challenges with uh, treatment treatment access specifically in, in other parts of the world um, that others would, would like to share? Yeah, perhaps I can just say a, a couple of words. I think sure. as a, a, a group of people who work with Delta patients, who see Delta patients and who are involved in their care, uh, it is now imperative that we start a campaign for global access issues because 
there are there are uh, medications in the pipeline that are coming that sooner than later would be would be approved somewhere or the other they are extremely expensive medications at the moment and they, they therefore that will be a major barrier uh, to, uh, to to treat these patients uh, governments are uh, you know the the, the the government of sin that 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 i spoke about the data they are very keen uh, to treat these patients because this is this becomes a political and a vote bank issue for them uh, in their own home yard in their own backyards and therefore they have sponsored regulated interferon treatment for a long long time and i think other things other other medications that will come in and may have reasonable access prices these medications will also be used and therefore uh, there is there is every need to advocate these uh, these these access issues i'm sure uh, a lot of people can will will, will benefit eventually Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think access is uh, is one of the challenges that's more unique by uh, by country and depending on what uh, what governments will fund and what support that they will offer. So that will um, certainly present a new set of challenges, but hopefully opportunities as well uh, for when when a lot of these medications in the pipeline are are approved for wider use. Um, so we are just one minute from the top of the hour. So um, I think we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, so just wanted to extend uh, sincere thanks to all of our panelists for joining today. Um, and thank you also to all of our audience members for participating in today's webinar. We very much hope that you found it inform informative and valuable for your life and work and that you can um, apply some of this information moving forward. Uh, and we encourage you to complete the evaluation form that will show up on your screen when the webinar concludes. And again, a recording of the webinar will be emailed out to all registrants. And we also encourage you to sign up for our hepatitis delta newsletters um, that are available for both providers and those living with hepatitis delta to be added to our mailing list and to receive regular updates about hepatitis delta drug development, clinical trials, research news, and other events such as this one. Um, so we will email out the sign up links for um, those newsletters in the follow up email as well. And do feel free to reach out to us and get in touch using the information on the website or on the slide and to visit our website, hepdeconnect.org, uh, for more information about all things hepatitis delta. Uh, so thank you so much again, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate your, your time and insights. So thank you very much um, and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.